the snares of this life. Now, whether you, I'm just going to throw the Hebrew and the Greek together. A snare usually and most often is a noose. And in this generation, most of us are familiar with, boy, he just stuck his head right in the noose. Well, that's kind of what it amounts to. And as you would learn in 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verse, I believe it's 23 or 26, one or the other, you find out who it is that most often sets that trap, that snare. It's the devil. He's on your case. When you stand against him, he's going to stand against you. And he's a pretty good old soldier, I'll tell you for sure, as far as getting his licks in. And... You, you know, we usually, when things are going good, our guard is Zippo. We just let our guards down, and I've, I'm so blessed, and everything is going so good, and Satan's right under you, sawing the floor right out from under you, you know, ripper, 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 yeah. You never let your guard down. And especially when, when you're planting seeds as a Christian, especially as a teacher, everything you say is monitored. Everything. And therefore, you must be really equipped with God's Word whereby you can think in terms of legality. But, of course, most of all, theologically speaking, sound, to have sound doctrine. Because you are, as a Christian, watched. And you have to set forth that good example. Now, that's not saying any of us are perfect. We're certainly not. But at least have your character good enough that when the bad comes along, you can, your character is going to stand. You know? Because good deeds will overcome a multitude of sins. Good deeds will overcome a multitude of sins. So let your character be such that when a little rough sailing comes along, you can stand up, get your head back. Christ has forgiven you on an honest repental. And stand up and go. Don't get your long face all down and, and walk right into the snare. I think probably, and now that kind of is a doctrinal little lecture about personal things in life, as how you are looked upon in your community, or by your friends, by neighbors, and by even, if you would, not only unbelievers, but believers. It all fits. Keep your head out of the noose. And most of all, beware of the one that will walk up to you and say, well, I can tell that you're a very fair person. That you're sound and you're well educated in the doctrine of Almighty God because you affect the lives of so many people. And you're outstanding in the community, and you're uh, just a perfect gentleman or lady. Watch out. Let the red flags go up, okay? That's the, Satan's method of finding your weak spot. Because the average person will say, oh, Lord, that's a good judge of character. <laughs> Got my number. I can let my guard down and just blabber all over myself to this person. That's Satan's main number one M.O., all right? Beware of a person that blows your trumpet way beyond perhaps what it should be blowing, all right? And getting your little ego to kind of ante to Satan's noose and stick your head in it. Be careful. I, that really wasn't part of the planned sermon, but I, maybe somebody needed it. We'll just throw that in for whatever, because the main news is not your personal character necessarily. The main news is not necessarily your little personal sins, as if any of them were little. But the main news is false teaching. The main news is false prophets. Those that come in Christ's name saying, I'll be Reverend Jones or whoever. God help Reverend Jones. I don't know any Reverend Jones, and we're not on to the Joneses' case, but you know what I'm talking about. Beware of false teachings. 
That's putting your head in the noose whereby it's kind of difficult for God to yank your soul back out of there sometimes because you've got to do it on your own. And if you're steeped in false teachings, you don't know whether your head is in the noose or what. Whether, and it's kind of like the chain gang. When you're all chained together, if one starts going down, the whole bunch does. Well, how do I prevent that? By studying God's Word and by using this gray matter up here to think for yourself. Think about things. Think about what's being said. Weigh it out. Analyze it. Think at it if you would. Hey, it doesn't hurt to think and to keep yourself protected legally. Now, naturally, as a teacher, that's one of the things that's in my mind because there are groups of people that like to sue churches for what is taught and what is said, advice that is given, and so forth. So you have to really be on guard, more so than most Christians might even think. And also in seed planting, you need to do the same thing. But again, I fall back to the most serious offense is to believe false teaching without analyzing it in God's Word to see if it be of a truth or not. Do you, do you know what happens in... in um, now, I don't want to knock denominationalism, so we'll call it traditions. Do you know what the biggest flaw of traditionalism is? is one will begin to build on another. One tradition of men will begin to build on another tradition of men. And you'd be surprised how many questions I get where some person will write in and said, I've heard it said, and I'm trying to think of an analogy so I don't offend anyone. If they're, now they're documenting my point. You have to be careful not to offend. Unless it's Satan and then just lay it on him, whopping good. But a person will say, well, it says in the Bible that, I'll use one that came in yesterday, that you don't believe in dinosaurs. Well, I go out on documentaries all the time on digs and so, but you see, a person that has been steeped in traditions of men doesn't know what you're saying when you say there were no dinosaurs in this earth age. There were no living dinosaurs in this earth age. Now think about that. That's simple. These children are aware of that. But a lot of people are not. Why? Traditions. This earth is only 6,000 years old, and it doesn't matter what kind of scientific proof you should give them. They've heard it. Grandpa said it. Grandma said it. And it's got to be so. Well, that ain't necessarily the fact, okay? Okay. Data is data to be considered, analyzed, inspected, absorbed, and then see what saith the Word of God. God's Word, of course, says this earth is millions of years old. But you still got false teachers, Bible thumpers, that will stand there and swear this Bible is only or this word is only, the world is only 6,000 years old and God's word says it. Well, it don't. It doesn't. It just isn't true. So you be very careful because you can allow your neck to slip in a noose and think you're traveling among well-prepared, well-studied peoples. But one little mistake in the beginning can, when you continue on down the road of God's Word, you can be a hundred miles off by the time you get to the book of Revelation. You know, if you don't believe me, drive, when you get ready to start home, take off 45 degrees or 90 degrees the opposite direction and let me know how long it takes you to get home. I don't think you'll be arriving there. You've got to go in the right direction. That's why we have to be aware of snares. Let's, as always, we use Christ as an example. Open your Bibles, if you would, to, first of all, I don't want you to forget uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 26, so that you know who's setting the snares for you if you be of Christ. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. Let's let Christ always be our example. Let's see what he, how he handled a like situation. 
And again, a snare, a noose, is something to catch someone in. And you know what? In most cases, in many t- cases in the Hebrew, it means by the nose. Okay? Snare them in the nose. And it, spiritually speaking, it means rob their mind. Okay? So, your, my advice to you is you must be wiser than the serpent. And so it is. All right, you are, if you're familiar with God's word. Matthew chapter 22, verse 15. The Pharisees are going to try to entrap or ensnare Christ. How does he handle it? Verse 15, Matthew 22. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. How they could get, how they could get him to stick his head in a noose. Hey, have they ever tried it with you, friend? How sharp are you? Think for yourself, always. Verse 16, And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians. Do you know? let's first, let's say, this is religious and political boys sent out together, all teamed up, all saddled up together here. We're going to take him, if not religiously, politically. All right? Watch out for that type today, okay? Um, Saying, Master, we know that thou art true. Honey do slipping all over it. You got it? We know. There's no doubt in our mind that thou art true. You're it. And teach us the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man. You don't show any partiality. You're the sweetest man on earth. For thou regardest not the person of men. Now, again, what did I say? Beware of flattery from men. All right? And if people use flattery on you, don't ever misunderstand. It's the word. That is powerful, you're not. Okay. You may have a great deal of knowledge from God's Word, but your knowledge came from the Word. So don't let every, anyone play on your banjo those strings of how great thou art. Okay. In other words, your ego is a built in noose in your own mind that we all kind of can be pulled into that if you're not careful. Do you see how they were trying this on Christ? You know, what they said was absolutely true. Because he was the word and he was truth. But he's allowing himself to be um, approached in this manner to put you on guard for what are they after? Have you forgotten the subject? What did they talk about that they wanted to do? Entangle him. Well, how do we entangle him? Blow him up. Make, make him or her think they're really something to get in their confidence. All right, got it? That's Satan's number one M.O. Verse 17. Then they follow up with their trickery. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? What are your thoughts on this, wise man? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Question. Verse 18, but you see here you've got the political and the religious thrown together. That's always kind of a red flag if you're not careful, okay? There you've got to think in two categories, and that overloads some people's donkey, you know? They have to think about two things at one time. Be very careful, okay? Now, verse 18, but Jesus perceived their wickedness. He could sense it, and he said, why tempt ye me Ye hypocrites. Now, first of all, what is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is an actor uh, under an assumed character to act under a false part, whether it be a false prophet, a false teacher, or what have you. If they're so steeped in the ways and traditions of men, do you think these Pharisees thought they were wrong? Of course not. They thought both politically and religiously that they were absolutely 100% correct. Why? They didn't recognize Christ. That's why. 
and they lied coming out the gate saying that they did recognize him, believed in him, and blah, 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 blah. Okay. So how did Christ answer this? Verse 19. Show me the tribute money, and they brought unto him a penny. 20. And he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription, or inscription, modern? 21. They say unto him, Caesar's. Everybody knows that. Child can tell you. It's a picture of Caesar. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. 22. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Their noose didn't work. Now, there are many that would say, well, they gave him the penny, he should have kept it. Every religious organization needs the penny. See, there's where you would have gone with the political and the worldly and got yourself totally out of the saddle coming out the gate. God's money doesn't come from the, from the world. God blesses. God guarantees God sees that his children and th that those that do right are blessed without taking it from the enemy, without falling in the enemy's hands. In other words, what did Jesus say? Give Caesar what is Caesar's, but give God what is God's. What, so you see, he, this takes care of God's work. All right? no, no problem with that. As a matter of fact, another place that would say, what, for you worry warts, if you want to worry, it will not add one second to your life. Quite frankly, if anything, it'll take away from it. All right? Because God, if he takes care of the little flowers and the little birds and all of this, he certainly knows what you have need of and he will add these things onto you if, there's a big condition here, if you seek the kingdom of heaven first in your mind, if it's foremost in your mind, if that's the category in which you're thinking, is to bless God, to help your brothers that are lost, misled, and sisters and children in the world that need truth. Okay. That that's the way you think and that's the way you stay in line. So, we see how Jesus handled that. He was wiser than they were, of course. How do you gain that wisdom? By understanding the simplicity in which Christ taught. Then your character can withstand any test that is brought against it. If you are innocent and if you have tried, even if you fall short, your character will outweigh any few mistakes that you make. All right? And quite frankly, if you stay in God's Word, you're not going to make all that many mistakes, uh, theologically speaking, all right, or doctrinally speaking, I prefer. So, one of the greatest snares that is recorded, we find in the Old Testament in the book of Ezekiel. And this is why I say that snares in doctrine are the ones that will sink your Christian boat if you're not careful. Why? Well, God wrote this letter to you, whereby you could be a little wiser than anyone else. We're going to change words just a little bit, but the Hebrew word is still noose, or to hunt, to try to slip that noose over your nose or in your nose, hook it, and turn you about. Spiritually violent, that violently is how Satan likes to do it. But you see, Christ isn't too worried about his elect. Do you know why? He really is not too worried about them at all. Do you know why? Because he gave us power and authority over Satan. And if Satan comes knocking on your door and you don't skin his head before he leaves, then you're really not one of God's elect. In other words, he knows we don't have to put up with it, number one. And hopefully his teachings and the simplicity that was just illustrated in Matthew 24, surely you can see how to take care of yourself. 
Surely you won't fall for that old crap, that old noose, that you're wiser than that. Why? He gave you gray matter to think with, think, and use it. Don't let anyone rattle your chain, okay? Don't get all excited and, and um, uh, overheat a fuse. You're one of God's children and you have the authority. You don't have to do anything anxiously, but timely. I repeat, do it timely. Okay, book of Ezekiel. I don't have to go into everything here, but I want to go to chapter 13. First, let's get the subject so we know what we're talking about. Verse 1, and the word of Matthew, Ezekiel chapter 13, uh, verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets. Prophesy against the prophets. Yeah, because they're a bunch of fakes, this particular prophet of Israel that prophesy and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. That's their own minds. God didn't send them. They didn't study. They just want to stand up and say, I have a word from God. This brother over here, I can tell he's, he's going to be a great man. Well, so what, what is that prophecy worth? It's coming from a fool. Because only a fool would stand up and say, I've got something from God when God didn't talk to him because that's dangerous. You know, God will burn your britches for that. Bad. Okay? So only a fool would do it. So that's what the prophecy is worth. Think for yourself. Think from God's word. Uh, Hear ye the word of the, of, uh, the Lord. Now that is when one prophesies out of their own heart. I wanted to set that up, that we're, the subject is against false prophets. Now skip to the 18th verse. 17th verse, we're going to go. Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people. This doesn't mean outside enemies, but your own people that make up part of the bride of Christ. For we are all the feminine in that sense, awaiting the wedding which prophesy out of their own heart, not from God. This means they're fakes, okay? And prophesy thou against them, saying, And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that sew pillows to all armholes and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt, that means to noose, uh, to trap, the word hunt here is one of those things, the same word, to entrap, enslave, souls, not your flesh, souls, your eternal souls. Will you hunt? You're going to put the noose on the souls of my people, and will you save the souls alive that came into me? Now, all of you are familiar with that, but I think for first-timers, I need to explain that what it's talking about here is God in other places said, I've had, I've had a salvation plan before I ever created this earth age. And here are my outreached arms to save. And you have a few of these knuckleheads that come along and make up these big stories about how they're going to gather back to me and try to work out their own salvation telling you you got to do this or you got to do that. And in their tradition, in their lies, in their false prophecies and teachings and doctrines, they have absolutely covered over the real plan of salvation. And in the Hebrew, when it says to every stature, it says to every great teacher or man, you've done this to them, made them look in that way. All right? or woman as far as that's concerned. We've had some pretty good woman teachers, biblically speaking. Um, Hulda was over a school of uh, theology in the Old Testament. Be that as it may, different subject, different time. Verse 19, And will you pollute me among my people? Do you want to make me look bad by covering up my word and my arms? For handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread, you want to just teach for money to slay the souls that should not die. 
and to save the souls alive that should not live by your lying to my people that hear your lies. God doesn't like liars. And I'm going to tell you something. If you start passing on traditions, I can only say one thing for you for the sake of your soul. I hope you've checked them out in the Word of God. Because it makes our father very unhappy and he will mess up your chicken house good. He will mess up your home good. If you're spreading false teachings without having checked them out in God's word, letter by letter, line by line, precept by precept, makes him very unhappy. And what is he saying here though, save the souls alive that should not die. Well, somebody that really teaches God's Word chapter by chapter, they try to put you out of business, friend. If they get an opportunity, they're going to stop your wagon short. But nothing stops God's war wagon, okay? Nothing. And if you're on it, you don't have to even give it the time of day because you're rolling on through. Nothing stops it. If you have done it according to God's plan, that's why Beware of the noose. Beware of the trap. It's so simple to overcome it, to be well informed in God's word. Verse 20, Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against. Does that say he's for? Does that say he's going to bless? No, it says, I am against your pillows, wherewith you hunt the souls to make them fly. And I will tear them from your arms and will let the souls go, even the souls that you hunt, to make them fly. Do you think the Father didn't know the rapture doctrine would come along? Of course he did. Man's fantasies and imaginations. So happens this one was a woman's imagination and fancy, but it was two men, preachers, that grabbed onto it and ran with it. And what did they teach? They said... You don't have to understand God's Word. You don't have to know or understand the book of Revelation because you're going to fly away like a big turkey. Okay. You're going to fly away like a big bird. And you know what? People will believe that. Absolutely will believe it. And do you know how easy they are then? Do you know how easy they are to fix up in their minds? They'll say, but you don't understand if you fly away, it says here you escape the hour of temptation. You don't escape temptation by running. You escape temptation by being too smarter than the tempter. You're going to be here and you'd better be smarter than the tempter. That's how you escape temptation because it is Satan who is the tempter. And quite frankly, rather than tempting, when he plays his little role of Jesus, the false Christ, I find him an abomination. And you should too. Nothing tempting about it. That's why you escape the temptation. And there's not a one in here that is educated in the Word of God that isn't anxious to make that stand and say, God, use me, and allow that Holy Spirit to speak through them before this falseness, the wickedness that misleads and deceives people. Is it any wonder that God is against it? Is it any wonder that people that are drawn into that have to beg and plead with people to support them. I mean, absolutely turn no better than a, in the sense of begging than a beggar on the street. Well, let's give it a new name. Let's call it a telethon. That sounds high tech there, you know. We can maybe bilk a few bucks off of the, it's the year 2000. Why don't we just come up with, send me $2,000 and don't worry about Y2K, we'll pray for you. We weren't worried about it to start out with. Okay. I'm just showing you examples of how people get caught up into lies without seeing what God's Word has to say. Now, what does God's Word have to say about somebody teaching your soul to fly? I, you know, it really takes a bright person, doesn't it? I'm against it. That's what he said. 
Hey, I, I can understand that. I hear it loud and clear. Verse 21. For your kerchiefs also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand. Hey, do you want to have your hand on that wagon of deception when God takes a hold of it and does the tearing? I don't. And they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted. That means noosed. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Why? He's going to thump their gourd. Good. It's not a thing to play with, my friend. It's very serious. Now, did he say your little sin of some bad habit you've got, which God help you if you do have bad habits. But, you know, but do you think that's as important as this? Having your soul washed in the waters of hell? Lies? Deception? That's not what God says. God said your eternal soul is more precious than that. This is serious, is what he's saying. He said, I'm going to shake them. I'm going to stir them. And when God stirs, he stirs with a mighty stick. 22, because with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad. My word doesn't hurt them or make them sad. And strengthen the hands of the wicked. You made it easy for them to rip off people when they begged you out of, of uh, support. That he should not return from his wicked ways by promising him life. Oh yes, it's so easy. You don't have to understand God's word. Just donate your money to us and be ready to fly. I'm just making friends and influencing people here. You know, good Christians enjoy the truth. And, and um, God's word is popular. I don't care whether I am popular or not. I think that's already been settled, really. You know, you can't teach God's word line by line and chapter by chapter and have the local brotherhood of pastors invite you to their meetings. You know, it doesn't go over too well. They would just as soon, they kind of appreciate your absence, me thinketh, all right? Different story for a different time. All right. But truth is supreme, and it's what God demands, okay? Um, 23, let's take the last verse of the chapter. Therefore, ye shall see no more vanity nor divine divinations. That's your trickery with your little noose. For I will deliver my people out of your hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Why? He's going to thump their gourd. Many that cry, Father, Father, oh, Jesus, we're so glad you're back. We've cast out demons in your name and we've just saved so many souls, and we're just happy to see you. What did Jesus say? Out of my sight, I never knew you. They start teaching a bunch of malarkey that's not biblical. Naturally, he, does it. he is the Word. And if your traditions are so opposite and obscure from the Word, it's unrecognizable. Aside from one thing, it can be recognized as the lies that certain would-be's have espoused through the nation. It's a time to be alert. It's a time to be careful. Again, your father wrote this letter to you. And he, he has always arranged the tools through uh, concordances, and uh, through the works of people of knowledge in the languages, that gives you the advantage whereby you can check it out for yourself. Do it. Don't listen to this man or any other man without knowing, thus saith the Lord. For he's going to hold you to that line. When he judges you, he's going to judge you by what he has said. What he has written or caused to be written. But make sure you're not embarrassed. Make sure you're not ashamed. Hey, they've got the snare out there for you. They're looking for you. They'll make promises. Join this organization. 
but keep it to yourself because we're the only ones going to heaven. Okay. And then over here they'll say, listen to us. We want your tithes to support this work where it is the great faithful according to this great man and that great man. Well, uh, wouldn't you rather study God's word than some man's word? Hmm? He wrote the letter to you. You want some man's rendition of it? Now, there's nothing wrong with studying a scholar, but check him out. And you know something? People send me works. Books, books, books. This great student, scholar, and so forth. I'll, sometimes they're good works, and sometimes I can read three pages and in the trash. It's obvious that they didn't know what they were talking about coming out the gate. And, you know, it doesn't take a, because it would go against the simplicity in which Christ taught. Don't waste your time with it. You know, you don't need that. You'd be better rereading the letter. All right. So stick to your Father's word. All right. Good books are fantastic. Good works are fantastic. Bad works, hey. Ezekiel, I'm sorry, let's turn to Isaiah a moment. Isaiah 24. It has to do, it's Isaiah's um, um, revelation or apocalypse, if you would. It's the, talking about the end, when God is going to turn this earth upside down. And again, he's asking that we expose faults teachers, and it tells about how the, that great city of confusion, which is Babylon, is all messed up, and well, we've kind of come to that place, haven't we? And how that God himself would bring hardships just before the end. Skip to the 16th verse of the 24th chapter. I'm just filling you in. This is as up-to-date as the book of Revelation, all right, because God is speaking and warning us. Verse 16, from the uttermost part of the earth have you heard songs, even glory to the righteous. But I said, my leanness, my leanness, or real Hebrew is my heart, my heart. Woe unto me, the treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously. Yea, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. And I have little doubt in my mind we're talking here about Antichrist, okay? That's terrible. That's really dealing. And the Kenites finally get around to it, okay? Satan does. 17, fear and the pit and the snare, that old noose hanging out there for you, are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. They're looking for you. They're looking for a home around your neck, your nose. Don't put up with it. And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the, new, the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh out of the, of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. Going to get the old news grabbing. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. This is why when the windows of heaven open, you can just about bet you've got supernatural entities here on earth, all right? Um, uh, prophetically speaking. The earth is utterly broken down, verse 19. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. It's teetering or tottering, whichever you want to call it, meaning it's just about this earth age, eon, has just about run its course. I mean, we're coming right up to the end. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. And that's not literal, okay? That doesn't happen until the literal, until the end of the millennium. And shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it. And it shall fall and not rise again. That's to say the one world political system. Why? Why will all government uh, agencies of this cosmos, this world, so to speak, government, be gone. Because there is one coming that is King of kings and Lord of lords. He's it. And that's why the others will fall. They'll reel. 
and they will go down. When does that happen? First day of the millennium, of course. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. In other words, there's going to be an overall doing away with kerchiefs, all right? Both in heaven and on earth. Where do you think Satan is? Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, Michael's standing guard on him. He's in heaven right now. His spirit can be on this earth. But he's going to get booted out, and he's coming here. And that's basically what this is talking about, from being from on high, so to speak. 22, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. Kind of like the end of the millennium if you take it to the ultimate. Then the moon shall be confounded black and the sun ashamed. It's going to turn pale. When the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancient um, uh, gloriously. What is it? His brightness overcomes the brightness of the world. That's what it's saying. You don't necessarily have to take that literally. The sun's not going to go dim. It's according to his goodness. It dims everything else. That gives us a great deal to look forward to if you haven't got a noose around your neck or your nose. If somebody hadn't placed hooks in your jaw, as they're called in um, Ezekiel chapter 39 and 38, if you've kept yourself free from uh, deception, an entanglement with the false Christ, whereby when the true Christ returns, he does know you. Where he will say, I love you. Where he will say, um, you have followed me. And that's all he requires, is that you follow him. It's in his word. Now, you can follow men, it's all right. But it's much better to follow him. Does this have anything to do with salvation? It's beyond salvation. Salvation is a wonderful, beautiful thing. It's real sad that many that think they're saved will be deceived by the false Christ because of fake new seed doctrine that has been taught on this earth. Because they're going to accept the false Messiah as the true Christ because you know what he's going to be teaching? I've come to fly you away. That's what the kerchiefs were set in place for. You were warned in God's word. And you know what? A lot of people are going to jump on his wagon thinking they're correct. Kind of sad, isn't it? It's real sad. Salvation is a beautiful thing. Whomsoever will believe upon me and my word. Did it say whomsoever will, will, will be, that believes upon the traditions of men or his word? choice is yours. Okay, let's go to, a, real quickly, one time, Romans chapter 11. You're familiar with this chapter because it has to do with those that have the truth, that know the truth, and that Satan would certainly live to, to deceive. Romans chapter 11, where it stipulates in verse 2, I'm just going to start reading there as you turn, God had not cast away his people which he foreknew from before. What do you not that uh, the scriptures say of Elijah, I pronounce it in the Hebrew instead of Greek, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed thy prophets, dig down thine oracles. I am left alone and they seek my life. God says, don't get shook up here. Why? Verse 4. But what saith the answer of God unto him? This you can count on. I have reserved to myself 7,000 men. There's no gender in that. Who have not bowed a knee to the image of Baal. That means the Antichrist. Now seven is spiritual completeness. That means whatever the number is, it's complete. Even so, then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Did it say volunteers? No, it said election 
of grace. Whose grace? His. Why? They earned it. And if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace, but if we be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Verse 7, what then? What are we going to say? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Blinded by who? Eight, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. This is why we came here. Listen carefully. And David saith, have you read it? What David said? Let their table be made a snare. That's, that's a, exactly what it is, a big noose. The table means where they study the Lord's word. And a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. It's according to whether you want to listen to God or man. But I've always been told all you have to do is be saved. Saved for what? What, do you, what kind of a servant are you if that's all you've ever done? is to take the step into salvation. Have you trained yourself? Do you know something? If you were to have a group of people working for you, and they worked for you 20 years, and they didn't know any more the f than they did the first day when they walked in, would you keep them on payroll? I don't think you would have kept them that long. God expects you to mature, not to stay on milk. And he sent the spirit of stupor. That's what the word slumber is in the Greek. Don't sleep on your watch. That's dangerous. Okay. Now we're going to conclude this in Luke 21. I don't have to tell you what Luke 21 is about. You all know it. It's where... The Antichrist is going to appear and many of you are going to be delivered up before him. That you're not to premeditate what you'll say beforehand because the Holy Spirit is going to speak through you at that time. And even the gainsayers um, cannot resist what you say. That's in verse 15 of Luke 21. And on it goes about how things will be right at that end as the false Christ stands upon this earth and many say, if I come in Jesus' name, he says, don't believe it. Check them out by the word, whether they be of Christ or not. Now, um, verse 27. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. This is his second return, okay? Second advent. And then he tells you of the fig tree. And when you see it planted, do you know what year it was planted in? That's when Israel became a nation again, 1948. You set a fig tree out not by seed. The horticulture of the matter is a shoot. And when it springs forth leaves, which it did then, he says, um, when they now shoot forth, verse 30, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Christ is very close to returning. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. No one knows any times, or dates, or anything else. But the generation of the fig tree began in the year of our Lord, 1948. How long is that generation? Some generations are 120 years. Some are 40 Verse 33, heaven and earth shall not pass away, but my words, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. That's why you could never waste time studying God's word. All of it, not a little of it, all of it. Because it's going to be with you from now on, like it or lump it. It was written to you telling you how to be successful, prosperous, and happy. 34, and take heed. That means be real careful to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness 
and cares of this life, this world, and so that day come upon you unawares. That means the noose is getting close. For as a snare, that's the old noose. This is what's important about seeing that the noose doesn't come around your neck, that you are delivered up before the false Messiah, that you don't hop in the sack with him. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. How many? All. Where are you going to be? Are you going to be prepared for it? Have you done your homework? Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. That is to say, our Father, Savior, Jesus Christ. That you haven't been sucked in to where he will say when he returns, get out of my sight. I, I, I never knew you. His word, he is the word. Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. You can never waste your time absorbing what he has for you in the manuscripts. Are you going to get it from the King James? Well, I wish I could say, oh yeah, you can. You can, basically. But if you want to really know, what does he say? What is his word? How was it written in Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew? You're going to have to go back a few times, friend, or you're going to be misled on a few points. There is a letter in the original King James. We carry them in our library. It is a letter from the translators to the reader of the good old King James. And they warn you to be careful. They've done their best. Because they took it from the Greek, the Aramaic, and the Hebrew. And we think we've done as best we can, but you better be able to check us out. I say the same thing to you. And that's why I recommend the study tools that I do. Whereby you as an English speaker without any great difficulty, if I say a certain word means a thing in Hebrew, that you can check me out because you're supposed to think for yourself and know for yourself. Beware of the snares of this life. The most important snares, the worst snares that are waiting for you are not your sins. That's bad, okay? I, I, let's make no excuses for that. That's bad. But let your character be such that you override that with repentance and asking his forgiveness. He paid a price for that. But the greatest snare is to be misled by vain and false prophets and teachers. That's why you don't listen to this man or any other man. Check them out. You've got the word. And you know how to use it. Father, we thank you for the living word. Thank you, Father, for having sent thy son that gives us a choice, Father, to think for ourselves, to study for ourselves, for we know we will be judged alone without anyone else. Help us stand before you, but most of all, help us to help others. We'll be careful to give you the praise in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Why, why, do, um, why do you teach from the Old Testament when we are not bound to it anymore? Oh, we're not. Who told you that? You know, Peter taught that uh, from the prophets of the Old and the Gospel, we were to be taught and learned. Let's see, let see where is that? Where is that? See if my mind will work real good here in sound doctrine. 
because I got me one here I like to make a little special teaching of here. Um, 2 Peter chapter 3. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds, there's that call to purity again, by way of remembrance. How's your memory, Emmett? That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. That's the Old Testament, son. Are you familiar with it? Have you read it? Prophets tell you what tomorrow brings. And of the commandments of us, the apostles, that's the new, of the Lord and Savior. Now, what you've been listening to, Emmett, is a bunch of soft-minded, uh, don't want to have to learn the whole Word of God to preach and collect a salary. Just learn the New Testament and stick with it. So you say... We are not bound to it anymore. Let's see. The commandment says, Thou shalt do no murder. Do you think you're free of that now? I don't think so. Wake up and smell the roses, son. That's why I teach the whole Word of God. And I just documented it for you from the Word of God. Do you believe it? Or the yo-yo that told you you weren't bound by it anymore? I'd be real careful. Your soul depends on the Word of God. And I, do you like go down and buy you a pair of shoes and throw one of them away because uh, one is passed? I don't think so. It's the whole Word. Now, nah, people get on to me and they say, well, people ask him questions and he just really gets bad with them. Well, he needed it. I love old Emmett, and I want him to wise up and know how important all of God's Word is. Otherwise, I could have said, Oh, well, yes, yeah, some preachers think this way and some that, and you'll just have to think as you think. Uh-uh. I'm going to rebuke lies and teach truth, sound doctrine, whether you like it or lump it, okay? So he'll, he'll love it. He will. You wait and see. T.D. from Texas. Is it wrong to pray for healing in a marriage and for all the hurt that has been there? Well, no, I think it would be an admirable thing to do. And uh, when you pray for the healing of the marriage, don't just pray for the healing, do something about it. Only one person can heal it, or two people, and that's the two people that are married. you got to do something about it. I, you know, well, there's a very good uh, method that when a marriage gets in trouble, how did you get along in the start? Oh my, it was heavenly. Oh, wonder why it was. Well, I was courting her. Well, court her again. Or you might be courting somebody else. Okay? And somebody else will be courting her.